Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Coffee Talks with The Real Deal. I'm Hinten Samtani. I'm filling in today for Amir Karangi. And today we have with us Meredith Marshall. He's a co-founder and managing partner of BRP Companies, which is a major affordable housing, workforce housing, and market raise housing developer in New York, New Jersey, Baltimore, and beyond. Uh, BRP actually made our list of uh, New York's most active developers in 2020 with uh, close to, I think, about 3 million square feet of projects uh, across uh, 10 different sites. So very, very active. And uh, we will talk a lot about that. We'll talk about developing in a time that is obviously uncertain and quite scary, not only for the real estate industry, but for the communities that you're active in. And right. we'll get right into it. So Meredith, uh, thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So I'd like to thank our sponsor as well. Uh, Coffee Talk is brought to you by Burden Accounting. Burden is one of the leading providers of specialized accounting services in many industries, including real estate. Burden, thank you for your support. We'll get started. Uh, I, I noticed on your on your website, uh, you talk about developing tomorrow's properties today. That's your, your slogan yes. of BRP. But I guess before we get into specifics, with tomorrow having changed in this last year, the definition of tomorrow has completely changed. How right. are you guys, how are you prepping for that? Like what's, <laughs> you right. look at, you look at your portfolio and a lot of it has to be probably reimagined, thought about it in different ways. So how do you go about it? Absolutely. And, you know, development is a dynamic process, right? So pre COVID, you know, we focused on workforce housing, inclusive neighborhoods, which means mixed income for all income strata uh, right. residents uh, from the lowest to more moderate. We, again, we build workforce housing, primarily in underserved, overlooked neighborhoods, yep. and we do a lot of PPP, public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. So a lot of city subsidy in some case, maybe more affordability in one, in one borough, the other borough, maybe 70, 30 affordable New York. Right. And maybe we do, like in Harlem, we have an 80, 20 condo. Uh, owing to the old 421A, where 20% of the units were sold to community residents at or below 125% of AMI, right. which is about 300,000 a unit for a two-bedroom condo in Harlem is a pretty good deal, right? Right. And you're, so, you're, you're active in neighborhoods that are often overlooked by other developers of your size, right? East correct. East, Jamaica, South Bronx. Central Harlem, et cetera. Right. Right. So, you, so you get the theme. So um, not much competition there for a quality product. Uh, we try to build highest and best use, so mixed income with some retail, mixed use, and there's still a tremendous need in those communities, right? Because when you have stay-at-home orders, you have to have a home to stay in. Yeah. So we still have uh, pretty good um, occupancy and, and collections. I mean, you know, because even with COVID, people need a place to stay. And if you provide decent housing, um, most residents would want to stay and pay their rent and if, if they could. And where they can't, we're, we're part of that project. Right. And, and that, that's an important sure. thing, Meredith, where you're talking about where they can't. I mean, COVID has disproportionately impacted a lot of the communities that you're active in, right? There's just no question it's been, you know, Mayor de Blasio talks about a tale of two cities. That's mm -hmm. certainly been the case with, with COVID, right? We're talking Absolutely. not only in terms of lives lost, but also in terms of economic uh, sort of implications. Mm -hmm. More people in the communities that you're active in have lost jobs. More people right. in those communities have are struggling to make rent. So how do you how do you reckon with that? How has that kind of changed the way you're thinking about your project? Well, the first thing we did was we we were um, honored to join the mayor's uh, task force, mm -hmm. COVID task force, from the real estate construction perspective, and we, along with some other not for profits and for profits, uh, raised a few million dollars for project called uh, Project Parachute. And we, BRP, we gave tens of thousands of dollars. I don't know the exact amount, mm. but it was a substantial amount to help provide um, a private uh, fund uh, to help some, you know, uh, folks who have been displaced or, or, or harmed uh, financially by, by the, by the uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, uh, we try to reach out and we're working with some not-for-profits now to reach out to some of our tenants who may be impacted and may not know about all the resources available. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a plethora of resources available and substantial resources with rent subsidies, um, rental assistance that they may not know because they're sort of, they're, they're not in this ecosystem, right? So we want them to continue to pay rent. We want them to be yep. a, a sustainable tenant, particularly in a, 
in a really scarce um, for a scarce resource like a below market um, unit, a uh, residential unit in which we build. Right, uh, about two thirds of our our portfolio um, is represented with below market units. Right, so why evict a tenant? I mean, there's an evicted more a moratorium. We don't want to evict tenants. We want them to pay rent. We want them to be, you know, active uh, members of our community. And the last thing we want to do is to to have an adverse um, relationship with them. So our entire goal here is to provide um, uh, more information for them and to work with community partners, stakeholders to make sure that we could provide resources when needed and, and when the resources are available. There's this narrative about, you know, how New Yorkers are fleeing the city in droves, but I'm assuming it doesn't really apply to the communities that you're building in, right? It seems like Correct. It, have most people stayed put? Has the population stayed about the same? Well, tell the two cities, the more wealth and income you have, <laughs> more the often. easier it is to, to leave and, and, and to camp in, you know, the Hamptons or Florida. And we have friends and more power to them. But most of our tenants, um, again, uh, we, we haven't had tremendous um, loss of, of, of occupancy or, or, or tenancy. Right. Um, we just haven't seen it. Let's talk a little bit about the financing for these projects then, right? Like one of the things that I, I think keeps a lot of people out of the game that you're in, which is public, private, affordable housing, workforce housing, is that it is extremely complex to put together the money for these Absolutely. projects, right? That, that is, I mean, you're an engineer, but the, the level of financial engineering involved in this must right. be something else. Uh, right. So what's the landscape like for financing given what's just happened over the past year. And you have, as we talked about, 3 million square feet at least right. In, right. in active projects, and then I think right. a couple million more uh, in, in the wait. Right. I think half of those projects require tremendous city subsidy. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, like Jamaica Crossing, that project we're, yep. we're about to uh, tenant the building. And um, we have 11 or 12 different sources of capital into that. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to give you an example. Yeah, we please. have low-income tax credits, brownfield tax credits, state tax credits, um, a EDC demolition loan. I'm sorry, ESDC, a state demolition loan. Right, yeah. We have the state has a middle-income program, MEP. So we, we we limit you know some of the income levels to want to, to moderate income. We have an HPD, HPD, HDC loans, first, second, third loans, and we have equity. We have about $75 million in equity, maybe right. 100 now of equity in that project. So, so is, that's is what it your took. job and, and yeah. let's say Jeff's job is, is most, right. of the, most of the sort of the job figuring out these various stages of finance? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and there's an opportunity zone. The only thing we didn't add to this is new market tax credits. And we, we were an allocatee. We actually know how to maneuver that, but it was too much brain damage, right? <laughs> okay. So- you're right. It's really financial engineering. Building the buildings actually and designing buildings is actually easy. Right. But it's how do you finance these? For, this is a four hundred million dollar project that has you know say a hundred million dollars worth of equity. We had the capital stack had to sort of involve another three hundred million dollars of miscellaneous subsidy, taxable bonds, tax exempt bonds, and a Freddie Ford. So if I showed you the capital structure chart, you, you would have to have a uh, uh, not even electrical engineering to get what I have. I have even smarter people, right? No, I, I mean, you should, you should send that. It's probably like <laughs> right. hieroglyphics at this point. Exactly, but, exactly. Uh, so you're right. So because we're dealing with scarce resources and we have to sort of, you know, work with the constraints of all of these different programs, right? And so, you know, what we're looking at, though, is a similar project. The next project we're building is just equity and debt. Mm -hmm. a traditional structure, but it's mm -hmm. owing to the affordable New York, which is 70-30. Right. The other project in Jamaica is 100% affordable up to 165% of AMI, but we have a third of the billing is extremely low income, 30s, 40s, 50% of AMI. Mm -hmm. Then there's a chunk that's between, say, 110, 130% of AMI. Then there's a chunk between 130 and 165 of AMI. But right? if you're, you're, you're tapping into, as you mentioned, city funds, state funds. The city's right. facing multi billion dollar shortfall. Absolutely. The state Absolutely. is as well. So, are Absolutely. they, is that taking away from your, I mean, how are you getting these across the line? Okay. So, if you look at our pipeline, I think one, two, three, four, four, five of those buildings needed tremendous city subsidy, and they're uh -huh. primarily on the lower end of the affordability spectrum, meaning most of the units are 80%, you know, which is the definition for HUD for affordable and below. Most of them, quite frankly, with income averaging, 
So you have some 80% in income averaging, you know, you have 80% of AMI, 6% of AMI, and maybe down to 40% of AMI in some cases, right? But the other side of our portfolio, we're building, you know, as per the um, constraints of the um, affordable New York. Yeah. So 70, 30, so 30% as a right affordability has certain different levels of affordability, probably averaging to say at 100 to 110% of affordable. So we have some at 130, some at 70 or 80% mm -hmm. of AMI, but that we're financing through traditional means. So yeah. equity and debt. Right. And we're still providing 30% affordable without subsidies, right? But and we're the, doing it- in, uh, sure. First part of your portfolio, uh, are, you, are you seeing that the city, like, is, are they able to honor the commitments made? Are they able to put those funds in at a time when, you know, the fiscal shortfall is huge, right? Well, well those buildings are being built. So the, so the capital has been allocated for those. Okay, okay. The future projects, quite frankly, with the city, we have a great project. The, the second phase of uh, our La Central project in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in the Bronx, in the Merrill section of the Bronx, this, this project has been delayed a little bit because the city has to sort of figure out how to allocate um, you know, across um, more projects with less funds, but we'll close that deal probably the end of this year. But the other projects are moving forward because we were clever enough to figure out different sources of capital, not necessarily subsidies, but we, we have a lot of investors who want to participate in, in workforce housing uh, yeah. development, right? Mm -hmm. But they didn't know how. So when I, when, when I gave you the, this, you know, the, the spiel about um, all those sources of capital, that's a CRA investor, typically investors who have to invest for Community Reinvestment Act reasons, right? Like the sophisticated money center banks who issue letter of credits, they buy the tax credits, they understand that world. But when you build workforce housing and you have to generate a certain rate of return, a lot of investors shy away from it because they think everything is Section 8 housing and yeah, everything yeah. It has to be a tax credit, but that's not the case. So in Jamaica and Central Harlem and even Central Brooklyn, you can get a decent rate of return not, not an abusive rate of return, which some people think, uh, but you can make an ad adequate rate of return. A lot of these investors are institutions that represent pension funds. Mm. So the same people who need the workforce housing are the, the ultimate investors. Right. But there's a disconnect in, in, in the narrative here because folks haven't really drilled down on who's who needs the housing, yep. who you're building for, and who's ultimately investing in the housing. And so I think I've, that's Sure. That's that's a great point, Meredith, because the, the disconnect in the narrative is part of it, right? Like right. the average New Yorker thinks of a developer as someone who's out to essentially squeeze out every dollar they can and is not building housing for the people who most need it. Uh, so without getting too technical, why do you think, just your overall thoughts, and why do you think it is so hard to build a straightforward middle-class housing project, just a market rate middle-class housing why is it so complicated to build? Why doesn't enough of it get built? Because we're not having enough of these conversations, right? Mm -hmm. So, so if if some people, even my daughter, who switched on and woke and everything, and really uh, switched on in terms of her uh, awareness, is saying, "Dad," and I had to explain it to her. She said, "If you build something nice in an underserved community, wouldn't that cause gentrification and people to be displaced?" And <laughs> that's not true. I said. Because you build something nice in the community for the people there does not mean you're displacing people because we build on vacant lots primarily or, you know, empty buildings. We don't we typically don't displace anyone. Right. I don't think we've displaced 20 households in our 20 years in existence. Right. So we're not displacing folks. And my sense is gentrification. We want to use that is caused really primarily economics 101 supply and demand imbalance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have a community that has great transportation decent housing stock, everyone's pressed for someplace to live in New York, the, the tale of two cities, the wealthier, more connected, higher income tenants will push out the people who are less connected and don't have the same incomes and the same wealth, right? Because if you're bidding against someone who has more resources, the highest price typically wins, typically, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what's happening in these communities. So if you build, like you said, more middle-class, more workforce housing in these same communities, one, it will stem the tide of, of, of demand, it, it would it would sort of tamp down demand, keep prices relatively, um, um, I would say, uh, robust, but not egregious. And at the same time, provide an outlet for people who are, who are coming into the city who, who want a decent place to live. And, and then I, are pricing the current residents. And, right? and I think to that, to like having a free market that is sensible, 
sometimes there's political moves that I, I'm trying to understand. So there's a new bill uh, that Brad Lanner introduced, mm -hmm. which says uh, nonprofits should essentially get first dibs on city owned land mm -hmm. for affordable mm -hmm. housing. Right. How does, how do you handle, or how do you, what's your kind of reaction to that kind of bill being put forward? They have free dibs now. It's willing buyer, willing seller. So I, I don't know if that's going to change. No, but I think what he it, said it, is, nice hey, let's, let's put, you know, nonprofit should essentially get first pass at this before, before let's say for-profit developers. You're talking about uh, that bill that says any unit above like four units in the city period, not just affordable housing, any building, mm. right? How does that work? Like that, that's not well thought out. I like Brad. You know, I, I dealt with him when he was at Pratt 17 years ago. He knows what he's doing. But, uh, you know, he, I mean, he, uh, maybe that works politically, but I don't see how that works. And it, it's not, I don't think it's illegal, quite frankly, because mm. you have to tie up your process 120 days. We work with not for profits. They don't want these buildings, right? I mean, you know, and they have to meet the, uh, you know, I think the last price, right? Somebody wants yeah. to pay $4 million. What is that? It's just a waste. It's not well thought out. Right. So, so on your end, as one of the sort of the biggest developers in the space, mm -hmm. you need to think about the narrative, right? So what, what right. do you and your colleagues do to, to project that message? Besides obviously coming well, talking with us, but what else do you do? I, I believe we're successful because, you know, first of all, I grew up in, I was born in Crown Heights and I grew up mm -hmm. in East Flatbush, mm -hmm. right? And my dad was one of those essential workers. He drove a bus for a living. So I'm a real <laughs> New Yorker, right? You went to so Brooklyn I, Tech. I went to Brooklyn that, Tech, right? public schools, yada, 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 right? And, I, you know, I love Brooklyn. I love the Yankees and the Mets and, <laughs> and the Knicks and the Nets. You know, I'm not a hockey guy, but I love all New York teams. I'm a New Yorker through and through, right? Mm -hmm. And I have friends in all different communities, all different ethnicity quote unquote races and everything. And I think that we get the story wrong in New York, right? We need to build more workforce housing for the typical New York City worker, mm -hmm. right? And do it in a way we could restrict the incomes, but I think we need naturally occurring. We can't all do it with HPD and city subsidy because we just don't have enough money. We should have naturally occurring affordable housing, increase the supply, we should get people like yourself and people who know real estate to get around the table, which some of the not-for-profits with the bread lenders of the World City Council say, look, let, let's, let's, let's have the same set of facts here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How many units of workforce housing do we need in the city? 50,000, let's say. And we're only building 20. That's the shortfall. Let's mm -hmm. come up with a creative plan for the shortfall. Some of it will be, you know, government largesse, tax credit, taxes and bonds, but we could have naturally occurring affordable housing by, by increasing the zoning where it warranted around transit zones, mm -hmm. right? Using the tax code efficiently to create more, you know, more income for those buildings. Mm -hmm. And we could include not-for-profits in that. We could include for-profits, not-for-profits in the government, but it's done in a way that everybody participates. And it's not a trick like you have to offer, you know, for 120 days or not-for-profit. That's not going to do anything. Yeah. And he knows yeah. that. I, I guess like in, an, in an election year. That, but can they show me on paper how that works? Because I, I, I see units all the time. No one's buying these investment units. So the not-for-profit right now can call all the investment banks and bid on them right now. What changes? I guess in an election year, that stuff just plays right, well. Right. And I think you somehow yeah. have to transcend that. I want to zoom out and talk a little bit about your very, very unusual and interesting career. But before I get there, uh, one question on how, what, what your relationship is like with Margaret's team at Goldman Sachs yes. and how that works. I know that they've, they've taken quite a big position in your projects now. I want to say yes. last count, more than half a billion dollars in various projects. So I want right. to get a sense of how that works. Well, look, and that number is close to a billion, but that number is not equity. Most of that number mm -hmm. is, um, I mean, some equity, but it's throughout the capital stack. So a lot of uh, construction lending, Tax credits is a big number, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we met Goldman Sachs back in 2000, ooh, 15 years ago now. And we engaged in a strategic partnership in 2007. This is the Urban Investment Group. So the group in charge with investing in underserved communities. And you know, we, we want to invest in, in catalytic and transformative projects. Mm -hmm. And so they made their first committed commitment to us in November 2007. It was a big splash that they invest in this minority company. It was, it was $20 million. They interviewed me on Bloomberg. It was a $20 million <laughs> investment. Right. At the time, we had seven workers, and we had a storefront on Fulton Street in Brooklyn. 
And now we have 70 employees or whatever, I don't know the exact name, and we have a multi-billion dollar portfolio. So it served us well, and primarily we build affordable housing. Um, you know, we have a multi-billion dollar portfolio, but I'm not a billionaire because a lot of it's affordable housing and <laughs> the profits are non-existent, but we enjoy what we do. So we're, we're a for-profit mission-driven organization, and you could be both, sort of triple bottom line. And I hate to say this, I'm not a great developer because um, I don't maximize every dollar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in some instances, we could choose to build a 100% market rate, but we choose to build maybe a 50-50, maybe a 70-30, because it means something to us to do good and do well at the same time, right? And so, you know, other developers have a different view. And I think mm -hmm. people sort of um, um, uh, conflate, you know, a bad actor that's a landowner or yeah. a landlord and a developer, particularly affordable developer. I'm, I'm in a lot of groups like SAF and other groups, and most of them are good guys, you know, they have to make a profit, but mm -hmm. they're delivering affordable housing that has these mandates and constraints and regulatory um, strictures that limit their, their, um, their, their, their return and limit their, you know, their, their return on investment. And if it's a not-for-profit, you have to abide by those same strictures and rules, yeah. right? So what's the difference, right? If it's for profit, not for profit, folks thinks just because of not for profit owns it, they're not gonna, they're not gonna collect my rent. I right. need to pay the bills. Like it's nonsense, and we need a fully formed to keep our democracy. And we're seeing that here in the country. We need to have intelligent people or people that are well informed. And in New York City, which is a great city, I love. It. I think it's the best city in the world. Eighty percent of us are misinformed about this, and it's because all the gobbledygook, right? When I got into this, I didn't know what a and new market task was. There's a Qualip B, there's a CDE, mm. there's a Light Tech and mm. Slick and all these things. And people don't know, like a lot of people in neighbors said, we want affordable housing, we want low income, but they don't realize the average resident will not qualify because they make more than the, the, the AMI, Light Tech, right, right. right AMI. Yeah. And they don't know the marketing ban is 10%. So if we need 48,000 for a family of four, if you make 50,000, $1, yeah. you're $1 too much. On the marketing Can, band. Yeah, so, you know, this is a not the greatest person to invoke, but Herman Cain had right. his 999 simplified right. plan. Right. And, and I'm not saying that plan made any sense, but right. what I'm saying is it was easy to understand. Right. Is there a future in which all your acronyms, your HDC, your EBD, all of that stuff could be simplified into something that is A, easy for people to understand, so easy for people to engage with, mm -hmm. and B, it doesn't need someone with your you know, extensive experience to get in the game. Do you think that there's a future that that could happen? Uh, wow, that's a very good question. You know what I think is more likely and what could happen, what should happen for the city, is that we take people who don't understand this process out of decision-making process, <laughs> okay. right? right? Because you know, uh -huh. my, my brother-in-law is a, is a very successful orthopedic surgeon. Mm. I can't pick his brain in a, you know, in a lunch. I can't pick his brain over 10 years mm. to, to, to absorb as much as he probably have, you know, has forgotten <laughs> over his right. tenure, right? So this is very complicated. You know, I went to Brooklyn Tech, so I learned how to read blueprints a long time ago. And I, I wasn't dating myself, but it was, you know, over 30 years ago, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so I did engineering, I did finance, right? And, you know, I know marketing, right? I went to Columbia Business School. I, I put all those things together and I think I'm a pretty successful developer. And even I don't know everything because there are different rules that come out and I have a team, I have architects here, I have engineers, marketing people, I have, you know, all these people that put it together and we're yep. fully integrated shop, right? Yep. And we don't know everything, but it's hard to put that upon a community board or a council person is term limited. So they can't make, it, and you know, no one wants to say, I don't know it. It's not because they're not intelligent. No, no, I, I get it's what because, you're saying. So what we see in other cities, and we're in probably six different jurisdictions now, right? We're probably building more outside of New York than we are in New York. That's another story. But what we're finding the most successful places have a group of six people, right? And they're charged with, they change the zoning, they bring everybody in and everybody's on the same page, but they're not, you're not going to a community board land use that they don't have a clue. I'm sorry, mm. but that's what mm. we're having in New York City. Or the council person may not just understand this, right? And so you have the issue a couple of years ago when they changed 421A. Yeah. Some people want to be excluded, but they were included because they didn't understand the legislation that they prepared, right? Yeah. Let's be yeah. honest. So we need to re rethink this thing. And I don't think everybody needs to know, 
but I think that we need to have confidence in the leadership right. and we have a, a city or state uh, function that have competent people. I think they could get paid market rate you know, salaries yeah. and they make the decision. It's transparent, but we know on these transit modes, we're, we're taking it from eight stories to 17 stories, but we can house everyone in there and there's no displacement. We can take section eight certificates, right? We won't discriminate against women and minorities and people of different ethnicities and religions. And, but it, it could be it could be the law and we could respect the law, but we don't have to have 18 different, I, I present to people all the time yep. and I know they don't know what I'm talking about, Yeah, you're right? Right. And I yeah. was a banker. I could even take some bankers who are new. They can't because uh -huh. I, I was trained by the best 25 years ago. Uh -huh. I, I did all these things. Right. Yeah. When I was 26 years old. working you're, on you're, you're dollars. So, so so, you know, it's just like you, you can't do it like, you know, like a plumber, master plumber. He knows what's wrong. He can smell it and come in. Right. And you have a new guy who doesn't understand that. So yeah. there's no way we can translate that. You you. All the acronyms. There are people in the staff of this. I know there's a guy named Martin Dunn and Ron Mullis, all these people, Kirk Goodrich. They know everything because they've been mm. around 30 mm -hmm. years ago. And we work with a, a lot of construction. I love construction guys, especially the old carpenters. And they said, I'm not better than you. I don't know more than you. I've seen it all. Yeah. And because I've seen it all, I know it. I know more than you do. So there's no way somebody, you could have the smartest person, they win an election, people like them, they look good, they're intelligent, but they don't know what they're talking about. Right. So and they come up with these schemes that make sense, but it's not going to, you can, you can change all of that and you can let the not-for-profits bid on that, or you could, you could make everything union wages. It's not going to solve our problem. Right. Your answer is, uh, I appreciate it because it's honest and uh, it's, it's hopeful, but in not, not in that sort of way that, a lot of people think about, I guess, so there's no way to avoid the complexity is, is what you're saying, but there's no way to avoid, right. But, yeah. but, but we have to look but, at the data, right. And uh -huh. we have to trust the experts on the data and the data suggests we need to build, like no one can tell me, right. And all, all the fighting with, you know, affordable for whom, you know, it has to be low income. We have to be prevailing with, no one can tell me how many units we need in New York city to alleviate the crisis on a yearly basis. Yep. Right. And if we need 50 and we build 30, come up with a plan to build an additional 20. That's never done. Yep. So we're into planning. And then you, you could bring excluded groups in. You could solve the problem. You could figure out what the capital gaps are, the financial gaps. We're not doing that. It's always a gimmick because, you know, you have one group here on the other side. And look, it could be the for profit guys. Right. Mm -hmm. They want to make more profit. Mm -hmm. But we can balance all of this. But again, you know, targeting affordable. Think about it. Affordable builders are limited. You know, I have a massive portfolio and I can tell you, I'm not a billionaire, yeah. you know, um, not even close, right? I told you my wife about it. She goes, you're closing deals, where's the money? I'm like, well, it's going into the deal and whatever. The right. fee, oh, we may not get the fee because it took too long. You know, we have some deals, we make no money, but it's a beautiful building. People are housed, but right. it's affordable housing. You have to build more of it. But then we, we could move, make it more inclusive. So it could be a market rate and affordable at the same time. I think it's better for social mobility, quite frankly, not to have concentrated poverty. How about that, right? Yeah, yeah. And just I think look that's at the, the we, idea is sure. that you can aspire to something that you can't see, right? That's the right. sort of Absolutely. big thing. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and we have the data. Right. That's that's it. We we have everything we need. The, the city. This is we're the finance financial capital of the world, right? Mm -hmm. We're the best architectural firms in the world. Some uh, other places, but some reside here. We have the engineering capability, the construction capability. We have yeah. the know-how. We have 100,000 homeless people, 100,000 kids in the New York public school system that are homeless or, or housing insecure. Like, why? What, what is that? Do we have yeah. enough city council people? Do we have enough community boards? What is it? Like, do we need more of what? We need more housing. So we're limiting the housing. The same people who say we don't have enough housing are limiting housing. I'm building things in underserved neighborhoods on city owned land mm -hmm. rezoning taking up from six stories to eight stories yeah why not 15 stories downtown you're building 100 stories for the super wealthy empty buildings yeah. right <laughs> but around train station you say no because you're gonna and people well-meaning people in the community but who knew who mm -hmm. knew my mother who went to school with my high school with my mother tell me well we don't want other rich people moving in here so we'd rather not build anything yeah Right. Sounds like we we need to we need to talk about this in in several conversations. I do want to get to your own life and your own career. Uh, so sure. Meredith, you don't look like a frat bro. 
in any way. But I think one of your breakthroughs into the industry was actually building or renting to frat bros. Talk a little bit about that. I saw that story. I needed to yeah. ask you about it. So you were yeah. in Boston with your partner, your so current partner. Right. And and you you buy a house, you buy a three-story mm-hmm. house, and you mm-hmm. decide to rent it. Just talk a little bit about that very quickly. Okay. So I was in a fraternity. Well, I'm in a fraternity. It's African uh-huh. American fraternity. So mm-hmm. um um it's Capital for Psi. And we, you know, in Boston, you know, you have the city's chap, so you go to MIT and all these schools, and you see those wonderful frat homes. Mm-hmm. African American frats didn't have frat houses, right? Okay. But what we did have is we had connections. So, you know, I had um you know, we have roommates from different schools, Harvard, MIT, Northeastern, BC. We all would team up in, in rent places. And it's, uh, it'll be a quasi frat house, right? Mm-hmm. So we said, why don't we get a frat house? And, you know, some of our fraternity brothers said, no, nah, we, we don't want to get into the real estate business. So as soon as we graduated, I was 22. I think my business, Jeff, was the same age. Um, we bought a row house from a Harvard professor in, in Roxbury. And we converted to three condos. And then... The condos we had separate bedrooms so we had you know a couple guys from harvard mit northeastern some kids that came up from yale to work in boston we all roomed in that building we had great parties and it was a time when the celtics was past the larry bird era but they Uh had reggie lewis who went to northeastern with my buddy so reggie would come to so we had boston it was a great place Uh and it was called 99 cedar street or people would call it club babaloo but it Love was the blue. place. And, and there's some famous people who went to Harvard Law School and business school who would come there. I can't mention them. But we had the sort of the, the, the total uh, African-American. It was, the, it was, it the, was spot. the spot. It was the spot back in the late 80s, early 90s. And that was your first kind of flavor of the real estate business? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was primarily to, you know, own our own and have some place to, you know, bring the young fraternity guys that are pledging, but also, you know, the girlfriends and we wanted to own our own place. Right. And, and we changed the bathroom and we did the tile and we kind of learned the business. And then Jeff and I went back, he went to university of Chicago business school. I went to Columbia, we worked on wall street, but we always thought about, look, we want to get back into this game. So while we were working on wall street, we started, we, we bought the brownstone we lived in. And then we started buying up everything in Fort Greene, Clinton Hill. And, after a while, we probably had a $20 million portfolio. And then we, we, we there was a friend of the family in 2005 that uh, seated us with um, about $10 million. And then, you know, that's not a lot of money now. They can't buy a mm-hmm. condo. But back mm-hmm. then, we could secure some some sites. And then we met, uh, we were introduced to Goldman in 2007. And that really allowed us to, to really scale. But on the way, you mentioned Wall Street. You had not a typical Wall Street career either. You worked with I mean, one of the most colorful personalities in business, uh, Prince Al Walid bin Talal Saud. You, you yes. were like his, his sort of investment. You were running his investment vehicle in Africa. Uh, right. Talk a little bit about what was that, what that was like. Okay, so prior, could I go one one job before that? So mm-hmm. after business school, I worked for Wasserstein Perella, uh-huh. and and I was the telecom guy because is I was that electrical Bruce's? engineer. Is that, is Bruce Wasserstein, right? Okay. Bruce yeah. Wasserstein, Joe Perella, the late yeah. Bruce Wasserstein. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was fortunate enough to 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 work there uh, w- before convergence. So before telecom and media converged, right? Mm-hmm. So, but we we knew the plans that Apple would have the phone and all all these things. F- FiOS was fiber to the home. But I worked on these 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 um, products when I was at AT and T Bell Labs. So I was electrical engineer um, working for AT and AT and T Bell Labs. I went to business school and then I worked in telecom banking, right? And then after that, I saw a tremendous opportunity in, in mobile telephony. Mm-hmm. So we pitched Prince Awali after three or four years working on Wall Street. I said, look, I'm better off on the principal side. Okay. So through another connection, because I did a stint at the World Bank, we helped write the Zimbabwe telecommunication plan in 1991 for the World Bank. Uh-huh. Uh, myself and an ex-Bell Labber. The, the World Bank basically hires experts to, to on their on their trade missions. I don't think people knew that. Mm-hmm. And so I thought I was going to do that the rest of my life because I think we made $20,000 for 30 days worth of work. And but that didn't work out. So I worked for for Washington Perella. Uh-huh. And then three this years is before. I went, sorry to interrupt him. Is this sure. before there? I was just curious because I used to I used to be a big cricket fan. I am a big cricket fan, so I know a little bit about uh, this. Was there like the the land reforms and stuff in Zimbabwe, which were quite dramatic? Is that around this time or no? No, I'm a little okay. older. So okay. <laughs> Mugabe was was, was well liked back then when we were Fair there. Enough. We actually met him. Anyway, continue. continue. It was before then, so and I could, we can get into all those things. And I met 
the clerk before Mandela. I can get into all those things. Mm -hmm. President Museveni, you mm -hmm. know, we've probably been to maybe 30 African countries. But anyway, um, so after Wasserstein, I decided to, to, to work in, um, to sort of raise capital to invest in African telephony. That was the goal. So through a, a friend who I met on that World Bank mission, he introduced me to uh, 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 Prince Awalid. And we met his team and we said, we want to do telecom in Africa. And he says, you know something? I just don't want telecom. I want banking. I want other things. So we, we set up a group and the group was basically um, Kingdom Holding Africa mm -hmm. was the group. Mm -hmm. And we invested. We were one of the first private equity firms to invest in Africa in, in, the, in the late 90s. It was a precursor to everything that's going on now. And we set up in Johannesburg. We used to do a lot of Riyadh, New York, Washington, Johannesburg, but we were in Malaysia. So we met everyone who wanted to invest in Africa, but I believe we were a bit early. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is before the Chinese and, yeah. you know, um, we were a bit early, a um, bit aspirational, but um, I thought we did a good job. We met well, um, but sometimes, you know, the, the, the local environment isn't as conducive to private investment, right? right? Yeah. We wanted to go, you know, 30 year old guys, we wanted to push it and it was a little, a little early. So my partners uh, still, uh, you know, they, they're still advisors in, in South Africa. Um, I was married and had one child and some kids on the way. So I decided to, to build a, a real estate business, but I still have a love for Africa and a love for emerging markets. I can imagine, I mean, how exciting that would have been, you know, as much of so much opportunity and still unrealized when you went there. Uh, I guess, right. do you, do you miss that, miss the rush of that kind of deal making now and in, in what you're doing? Absolutely. 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 But it's different. Like, you know, it's almost the same and it's different. I work in emerging markets now, right? In They're sense, emerging yeah, yeah, domestic yeah. markets. So it's similar similarities there. It's not as exotic and the way we did it back then was a bit, um, I would say, uh, high class. <laughs> you know, uh, we couldn't get to certain countries on, on public trips, so we had to take private plane. You know, we had resources, and yeah. you know, yeah. um, and it was a little different. Uh, you know, you're dealing with presidents of countries and the World Bank and big multinational firms, and you know, you're not building affordable houses. So it's a little different. Yeah. But I like what I do now, and you know, uh, at some point maybe we could marry the two, right? Maybe we could, <laughs> you know. We'll you know, it's, it's still hopefully not going to still have a lot of time, but it was it was definitely exciting. I could tell you stories, but it'll take hours. Yeah, I think it's it's a fascinating <laughs> yeah. career. And the colorful uh, people uh, we met. <laughs> I, I, I can imagine. And maybe this is a we should talk more offline. But yes. for now, I, I want to just wrap up here um, with Meredith Mar Marshall of BRP Companies. And this talk has been sponsored by Burden Accounting. Meredith, thank you again for your time. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. I really appreciate the opportunity.